All right, what is going on guys? Welcome back to the BTB Fitness Podcast and welcome back to the YouTube channel. I hope that everyone listening to this video had a happy holidays and a Merry Christmas. I'm actually filming this video on New Year's Eve, so by the time that you guys watch it, uh, New Year's will have already passed, so hopefully you guys had a good New Year's as well. Hopefully you had a lot of fun if you went out and stayed safe uh, and stayed responsible, you know? Uh, but again, guys, I, I kind of want to just wish uh, you guys had a, a happy holidays uh, and hope everything went smooth for you guys. I uh, hope you got to enjoy a bunch of food uh, and spend time with friends and family. So uh, we're going to go ahead and get into today's topic. So uh, if you guys have been following me either on TikTok or Instagram uh, for, uh, I, I guess, any amount uh, of time recently, you'll probably be familiar with the notion that I'm going to be starting uh, my cut uh, coming up here in the beginning uh, of January. And what I kind of want to talk about today is I kind of want to just like recap uh, my past year uh, of training because this past year uh, was the best year of training that I've ever had. And I kind of want to talk about my starting point for the cut and kind of how I transition uh, between being at peak bulk uh, to getting into uh, a cutting phase. And so we're going to go over a lot of X's and O's today. Uh, I'm going to be giving you guys some of my feedback uh, and, and thoughts and everything. And then as well as really laying out to you guys like how I kind of adjust training, nutrition, PEDs and stuff uh, as I move into a caloric deficit. So if we go over uh, today's itinerary, what are the things we're going to be talking about today? Uh, we're going to be talking about my starting point, like I said. So where am I at right now as I start the cut? Uh, and what's kind of some background information that you guys may want to know uh, that will kind of, I, I guess, help you paint the picture uh, and, and help you understand why I made some of the decisions that I made uh, as I transition into my cutting phase. I want to talk about what my goal is with this cutting phase that I'm entering. And then we'll start to get into some actual X's and O's. Like what are some of the adjustments that I've made for my training, uh, nutrition, expenditure, and PEDs as I transition from the peak bulking phase uh, into my cutting phase. So we'll go ahead and we'll just jump right into it today. I kind of want to talk about my starting point. Like where am I starting my cut at? And what's kind of some background information that may be beneficial for you guys uh, to understand uh, as I go through here. So as I mentioned earlier, I'm really coming off my best year uh, of training that I've ever had in terms of, of progression and, and where I started my lifts at at the beginning of the year compared to where I ended them at at the uh, beginning of, or at the end of the year. Uh, it was without a doubt uh, my best year of training. And, and I could probably make an entire video about uh, you know why this was my best year of training. But a, a lot of the main points is that early on uh, in the year, uh, I made an adjustment to my training schedule to allow me to train four days per week, which really, really allowed me to maximize recovery and really allowed me uh, to take very aggressive progressions uh, within the gym. Previously, I was training five days, uh, sometimes four, uh, but it, it really came down to the way that I had my training scheduled, uh, I, I, which I've talked about before on my channel. I was really running a very leg heavy uh, focused program. And, and when you're running a, a program that's very heavily focused on improving legs, there's a very large amount of systemic fatigue that's present in those sessions uh, just because the exercises that you typically do on a leg day cause more fatigue per set than what you do uh, on another session. I'll, I'll talk about that exact point in, in a little bit here. Um, and, 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 and so it really was just a, a super smart decision uh, on my point to really prioritize recovery uh, and allow me to get uh, as strong uh, as I've ever been, which is another point. I, I, currently, as I'm sitting right now, I'm the strongest that I've ever been across all of my movements. Uh, I'm nearing on a three and a half plate uh, incline press, like a machine incline press, nearing a two and a half plate incline Smith press. Uh, I'm doing over six plates for reps on the hack squat. Uh, I'm doing three plate RDLs, uh, which, you know, depending uh, on who you are, who's, who's listening to this video, that may or may not be uh, impressive to you. But for me, those are definitely the best numbers that I have ever had uh, in terms of, uh, of strength and performance. And my execution is the best that it's ever been as well. Uh, my form and control has never been as good as it is now. So, uh, you know, we, we've got all time execution combined with all time strength. Uh, combined with the fact that I'm, I'm the, I finished this bulk at the heaviest body weight that I've ever been since I started bodybuilding. So I'm currently weighing about 230 pounds. 
uh, which for me, like I said, is, is not the heaviest that I've ever been in my entire life. Uh, for those of you guys who are familiar with my backstory, I kind of lived the first couple of years of my life pretty overweight. Uh, and I, I started my weight loss journey somewhere between 250 and 260 pounds. So uh, I've been heavier than 230 before in my life, but not in my bodybuilding life. In the last five years or so that I've been bodybuilding, uh, this is the heaviest body weight that I've ever been. Uh, and this past off season, I also took the highest PED dose that I have ever taken, uh, which was 350 milligrams of total anabolics with all of that coming from testosterone. So, you know, you, you start to look at all of these things is my best year of training, the heaviest body weight that I've ever been, the best my form has ever been, the most PEDs that I've ever taken. It, this is all kind of a recipe for like all time muscle mass basically and, and, and making a ton uh, of progress. Uh, on top of that, I'm also moving very little. So I'm only averaging about four to 5,000 steps per day. So I live a very sedentary lifestyle. I'm an online coach. I work from home. I'm self-employed. Uh, I basically spend all day uh, when I'm not in the gym. I, I basically spend all day either sitting on this couch or sitting in my like office area uh, in our bedroom at my desk and, and doing client and content work. Uh, I, I really do not move a lot. So uh, I, I have uh, very little expenditure that I'm doing on a daily basis, which gives me a lot of room to increase that. Uh, and then I'm also eating a ton. Right now I'm eating on average 4,250 calories per day. Uh, that is enough for me to maintain my weight. I've been maintaining my weight uh, for the course of uh, the past month and a half, probably six weeks or so I've been maintaining my body weight. Uh, and I'm maintaining it on around 4,250 calories per day. Uh, calories, this, uh, this bulk peaked at around 4,700. Uh, but uh, I, I brought my calories down just to be able to hold uh, my body weight. But uh, I'm, I'm eating a ton of food, and, and with that, my appetite is non-existent. Guys, m I have not uh, entered a calorie deficit. Uh, I actually had to go through in my coaching sheets uh, and look. I have not entered uh, a calorie deficit since uh, uh, December of last year. So, I mean, it's been over a year, probably 11 or, or 13 months or so, uh, that I have been consistently straight either in a calorie surplus or at calorie maintenance. I have not entered a calorie deficit one time in the past year. So my appetite is fucking non-existent. My, my calories have not been below 4,000 uh, for the past eight months. Uh, they haven't been uh, below 4,500 uh, with the exception of the past six weeks for six months. There was six months in a row there where I was eating anywhere between 45 to 4,700 calories uh, a day. And, and, and when that comes day after day after day, week after week after week, month after month after month, I don't have an appetite. Like I am straight up not hungry. And so I am mentally ready to diet. I am mentally ready to eat less food. I'm at a point like in my life right now where, where eating is a huge stress and eating is a huge struggle. It's just like, it's, it's just fucking annoying to have to do on a daily basis. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm really mentally looking forward uh, to getting into a diet phase. I'm also coming off uh, a two-week deload. Uh, so another thing, if you guys have been paying attention to my Instagram or TikTok, you'll know uh, that I finished off the last two weeks uh, of 2022 uh, with a two-week deload phase. So over the course of, I, I would have to check exactly what it is, but uh, I would say probably over the course of the last 14 or 15 days, uh, I've only trained six times. Uh, so there, there's been a lot of extra rest days in there. Uh, I, I felt like I needed to take a deload. It, it, it was, my body was giving me all the signs that I needed to take one. Uh, and on top of that, I wanted to start off my cut uh, relatively fresh uh, in terms of fatigue and the two week deload has allowed me to do that. Uh, I feel really, really good physically and really, really good mentally. Uh, and I'm ready to hit the ground running uh, with my cut, so to say. So, you know, if we kind of take a look at all of the things that I just mentioned, I really am in the perfect starting position uh, to be able to have a, a productive cut. I'm at all-time body weight. Uh, I'm at all-time strength. Uh, I'm eating a ton, and I have no mental desire to continue to eat more or to continue pushing the food, uh, and I'm doing very little steps and very little expenditure. And, and if we kind of wanted to create this like dream scenario in our head where we think, like, if I wanted to set myself up for a long, successful cut, 
what would be the best possible starting position that I could get myself in. In my opinion, the best starting position that you could be in with a cut is someone who's eating a ton of food and doing very little uh, energy expenditure. Uh, and obviously the reason for that is in order to lose weight, we need to create a calorie deficit. There's two ways that we can do that. We can decrease calories and or we can increase our expenditure. And so it would make sense uh, if I'm trying to commit to a long-term cutting phase how am I going to put myself in the best position to do that? It would be by giving me plenty of calories to work with so that I can, uh, I have plenty of food available to me that I can take away. And it would be having very little expenditure because I have plenty of room to add in steps uh, and get more steps within my day. Uh, and as I kind of talked about that, that is absolutely the case for me right now. I am without a doubt uh, in the perfect starting point for me to have a productive cutting phase. Uh, I've been bodybuilding for about five years and this is definitely the best uh, starting point that I've ever had for a cut uh, in my entire life. So I'm, I'm very, very excited about that. I, I really think that I, uh, you know, spending this past year building the muscle, pounding the food, getting stronger ha has really, really set me up uh, to have a productive cutting phase in 2023. Uh, and I'm very excited to go ahead and, and get started with it. I want to talk about what the goal uh, of this cut is, and, and obviously with any cut, the goal is to lose fat and, and lose weight and, and get leaner. Uh, but I think that this cut uh, has, you know, a, a little more, uh, I guess, noticeable goal uh, in it, and I guess I'll kind of talk about that in a second. Uh, so realistically right now, uh, in my opinion, I am too fat to continue bulking. So uh, even if I didn't want to cut and I wanted to continue pushing the bulk, realistically, my body is in a position where it's probably not going to be very receptive to that. Uh, my body fat is as high as I would like it to go. Uh, my fasted blood glucose is starting to climb. Uh, and mentally and physically, like... I don't want to eat more food and, and continuing to eat more food would really be a struggle for me. So regardless, whether I wanted to, to do a cut or not, I feel like I need to do a cut. My, my body is in the position where it needs to do one. Uh, I'm also really happy, as I mentioned earlier, with the muscle that I've built this year, and, and I'm kind of ready to uh, lose some body fat and kind of reveal that to myself. It, it's very, very apparent when I look in the mirror and when I look at my progress pictures that I've I've grown, uh, you know, noticeably this year. My clothes are fitting different. I, I really don't, have, you know, have many clothes available uh, to me in my closet anymore that that really fit comfortably. Uh, a lot of my stuff that used to fit comfortably is starting to get uh, tighter. Uh, but the issue with that, like. Like I said, it, you know, it, it's very obvious to me that I've built muscle. The issue with that is that I'm kind of starting to get to that point where I'm so chunky that it's kind of getting hard to see it when I look in the mirror. Uh, and that's kind of starting to play on me mentally as well. Like not only physically uh, is my body in a position where I'm ready to cut mentally, I'm in that position as well. You know, I don't, I don't feel great about myself when I, when I look in the mirror uh, and I look like this. I, I feel great about myself when I look in the mirror and realize that I built a shitload of muscle over the past year. Uh, but when I look at how uh, chunky I am at the moment, it doesn't necessarily make me feel the best. So, uh, you know, mentally ready to, to go ahead uh, and get that done. Um, I would absolutely love to compete uh, next year, 2023, late 2023. I, I would definitely love to compete and step on stage. Uh, and I need to get the ball rolling on my diet uh, in order for that uh, to happen. So uh, most of you guys will be familiar that I prepped my first client uh, this past year in early November. Uh, and going to a show in person and seeing the athletes in person and seeing how lean a lot of these guys are in person is a real eye-opening experience. You know, you're under the impression that you have to get lean and you need to get shredded to be able to do good in a bodybuilding show. But I don't think that you can really like quantify how lean and how shredded you have to get uh, until you see it in person. So when I went to the show and, and when I saw all these people in person and when I prepped Joey, uh, and I kind of talked about this in my, uh, in my, um, my recap uh, podcast uh, of prepping Joey. You know, when I started prepping Joey, I was like, okay, we're gonna have maybe 30 pounds to lose over the course of this prep. We ended up losing like 40 to 45 pounds over the course of the prep and we still had another 10 or so that we could go. So that was a real eye-opening experience to me that made me realize like, holy shit, like to get into contest shape, 
you really are going to have to push a lot further than, than what you think that you're going to have to. And, and I need to get the ball rolling on that. The, the last thing that I want to do as a competitor uh, is start a prep and then get to the point where I'm a couple of weeks out and I realize, fuck, if I had just started a couple of weeks earlier, you know, maybe started two months earlier and, and given myself more time to diet, I could present a much better package uh, on the stage. And, and that's actually really important to me, guys. I, I think uh, something that uh, is pretty important for me to, to get out there uh, is that I, I really want to compete and I want to compete very, very badly, but I don't want to compete just for the sake of competing. I want to compete and actually be able uh, to do well. A couple of reasons for that. Honestly, I've never, fuck, I, I've never really been good at anything in my life, honestly. And, and I feel like bodybuilding is really, uh, you know, the, one of the things that I have the potential to be decent at. So I want to, you know, see that potential realized. Um, also, uh, you know, I, I think that this may not get talked about a lot, but, but competing for me is also somewhat of a business decision. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, I am uh, an online coach and, and I have a, a lot of people that put their trust in me in order to guide them to their goals. And so in my eyes, to be able to stand on a stage and look like I belong kind of helps my business in, in, in the sense that it helps me prove that I'm not just some guy on the internet that's, you know, talking the talk. I also walk the walk. Uh, and, and so I feel uh, kind of a pretty strong pressure uh, to not just compete and get fifth. You know what I mean? You know, I, I want to compete and at least try to do well. Now, obviously, if I step on stage, you know, and there's a lot of really fucking good guys there and they beat me, then it is what it is. But uh, I will, I'll, I'll basically refuse to get on stage uh, unless I know that I'm going to present something that I uh, am happy with. Uh, and so I, I, I need to get the ball rolling uh, on the diet to be able to see if my physique is one uh, that I feel like it can be competitive with. Uh, you know, I've kind of mentioned this a couple times on my channel, but I feel like my upper body is decent. You know, my upper body is somewhat pretty good, uh, at least in my opinion. Uh, but my my legs needed a lot of work, uh, and and I'm really happy with the leg size that I've put on this year. Uh, but like I said, I I, I want to get leaner and and actually, you know get a better idea of what the physique looks like uh, with the improved legs. Uh, so at the moment, you know, I, I, I don't want to put out there that this cut is going to turn into a contest prep because I can't guarantee that. Uh, basically what I'm doing is, is I'm entering this cut and I'm using this cut as like a cleanup phase uh, and, and we'll see what happens as I get leaner. Maybe after I lose 20 to 25 pounds, I'll get a better idea of what my physique looks like. If I take a look in the mirror and I'm like, okay, the, the, the legs have come up noticeably from last year uh, and, and your physique kind of flows a little bit better, uh, then I will jump into a contest prep. But if I get leaner and I notice, hey, I still need, you know, maybe another year uh, of improving the legs or improving, you know, whatever muscle group it is, uh, then I will just diet until the point where I'm, I'm honestly kind of sick of dieting. And then I'll just turn around and I'll go back uh, into a bulk again. Like I said, guys, uh, I, I really want to compete, but I don't just want to compete for the sake of competing. The stage will always be there. Uh, I, I've wanted to compete for the past four years and I keep putting it off and off and off and off. Continuing to put it off for another year or two is, is honestly not something that really bothers me. Uh, I, I'm just very, very determined uh, that when I do step on stage, I can present a package that I'm proud of and I can present a package that I feel like represents me and, and, and my coaching businesses uh, and everything uh, like that. So uh, whether or not this turns into a prep or not is yet to be determined. Uh, but what I do know is that I do need to do a diet regardless. So it, it's just time to go ahead and get underway with that. Okay, so hopefully you guys kind of understand some more of the background uh, and kind of understand some more of the thought processes that I'm, I'm kind of going through uh, and some of my background information, like I said, and, and getting into my starting point. Uh, I kind of want to talk about some of the X's and O's, like what are some of the adjustments uh, that I've made to my training, nutrition, expenditure, and PEDs uh, as I enter uh, a calorie deficit. So I, I kind of want to like paint this picture for you guys uh, how training may or may not uh, and how obviously, you know, nutrition is going to change between a surplus and a deficit, but uh, there will be other pieces uh, of our bodybuilding puzzle that change uh, as we transition from a, a cut to a def or excuse me, from a bulk uh, to a deficit. So uh, let's talk about some of the adjustments uh, to the training uh, that I've made. So uh, as I mentioned, I I'm coming off a full year uh, of leg prioritization training uh, where my main goal this past year was to improve my legs. So I've talked about this in other videos before. Uh, I don't really want to go over my split too much uh, in this video, but I was trying 
training four days per week. Two of those days were full-blown leg days, and then one of those days was uh, a pull day that had extra leg work tacked onto it. So I was doing four workouts per week, and three of those had leg volume in there. Uh, I was training my legs at the highest uh, amount of volume that I had ever trained them at, at the highest frequency that I had ever trained them at, uh, and lo and behold, uh, I'm very uh, you know happy with the leg progress uh, that I have made this year. Now, as I enter a deficit, we need to understand that my thought process and, and your guys' thought process as you uh, are listening to this needs to change. When you're in a caloric surplus, obviously the goal is to build muscle mass. And the amount of work that we need to do in order to build muscle mass is more work than what we need to do in order to maintain it. And so as we shift into a caloric deficit, we, we really need to, to wrap our heads around this. I get shit about this on TikTok all the time. Uh, I always say it's very unlikely that you're going to be building muscle mass in a deficit and everyone loves to fucking argue with me uh, and give me shit for this. Here's what I'll say. Someone in my position who has been training for five to six years and not just going to the gym for five to six years, fucking training like the way that you guys see me doing it now, I've been doing that for five to six years. It is incredibly unlikely that I am going to be building muscle mass while I am in a caloric deficit. It's just realistically not going to happen. I don't have any expectations in my head that I'm going to build muscle mass as I go through this caloric deficit. And so with that in mind, my thought process needs to switch. If my goal is to uh, maintain my muscle mass and specifically what I'm really focusing on is keeping the leg size because I, I just busted my ass for a year to build my legs. I don't want to go into a deficit and lose any of that muscle that I built in my legs. I want to keep all of that so that as I get leaner, my physique flows better. I am going to be able to maintain my leg size with much less volume, much less frequency than what I needed in order to get my legs into this point. And so my thought process switches training wise when I go from a bulk into a deficit. When I enter a deficit, my thought process changes from I need to build muscle mass and, and, and do the highest amount of workload that I can do and recover from. It changes to I need to do the amount of work that I need to do to stimulate the muscle to stay and no more because my recovery capabilities in a deficit are worse than what they are in a surplus. If I continue to try and ask my body to, to keep up that high workload while also simultaneously giving it less energy to do that, I'm fighting an uphill battle. Uh, and, and when we get to the point where uh, I can no longer maintain the training performance in a deficit than what I was doing in a surplus, that's when I'm going to lose the muscle mass. And so I need to make some adjustments to my training program. I need to bring my leg training volume down uh, in order to make my training more recoverable for me as my food comes down. And, and that's kind of a, an ass backwards thought process that a lot of people uh, struggle to wrap their heads around. How can I keep my muscle mass by doing less? But I, pr I promise you guys, when you're in a calorie deficit, uh, maintaining your training performance is how you're going to maintain your muscle mass. And the way that you do that is by reducing your overall workload as your food comes down. Uh, so as I mentioned, obviously, the, the main goal is to keep uh, and maintain all of this leg size that I've built uh, over the course uh, of this past year. And I don't need to run a leg prioritization training phase in order to maintain my legs. I do need to run a leg prioritization phase in order to grow my legs. But as I've already mentioned, my goal is not to grow my legs right now. My goal is to maintain the size of my legs right now. And I can do that on much less work than what is needed uh, in order to, uh, to, to grow them. I don't need to train my legs every other day in order to maintain them. I was training my legs every other day in the off season in order to, to, to grow them, but I don't need to do that in order to maintain them. And so I do not need to run that same leg prioritization uh, training block uh, and training programming that I was running uh, when I was trying to build them. So uh, I have adjusted my training split to allow me to train things more evenly. If we take a look at my off-season training program, uh, it's very heavily leg focused. When you take a look at my cutting training program, it's very like even, like everything is, is being trained relatively equally. We'll go ahead and we'll actually look uh, at the split here. Uh, so you'll see my off-season split. I was training Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday, uh, and then my last workout would either be on Friday or Saturday, depending on how I felt. Uh, but I would train four days per week in the off-season. Legs A, pull plus quads, which is that pull workout. 
that had uh, some quad work in it, uh, and then legs uh, B session, and then a push session at the end of the week. As I transition into my cut, uh, I have adjusted my split to a push-pull, rest, legs, rest, split. So uh, this does a couple of things. One, it shifts up my total uh, daily, or excuse me, weekly days of training from four to five. So instead of training four days per week, now I am training five days per week, uh, which I'll kind of talk about why I make these changes uh, in a second here. Uh, but it also kind of gets me away from having a set uh, routine schedule. So in the off season, it was Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday, and then either Friday or Saturday for the final session. Now I train two days on, one day off, one day on, one day off, and that schedule is always going to be constantly uh, rotating uh, through the week. As I mentioned, I kind of want to talk about why uh, I made these changes. So the main reason why I made these changes is because it adds in more rest between the leg workouts, which will help me recover and maintain my leg performance. As you guys saw from my off-season split, I was training my legs every other day, every other day. So you kill yourself in the gym for a leg workout and then you have a very short period of time to recover before you do another leg workout. And in the case of a calorie deficit, I don't think that that's advantageous and I don't think that that's, nece that's necessary in order to maintain my leg size, uh, as I mentioned. And so by uh, changing my split, instead of training my legs every other day, now I'm training my legs every five days, which is a huge decrease in frequency, uh, which allows more time in between each leg session to allow me more time to recover so that when I come into the next leg session, I'm fully 100% recovered uh, and ready to, to get after it again. Uh, it also increases the frequency of my push and pull days for my bulk. So if you guys could see uh, in my push and pull days in the off season, I was only doing push once every seven days uh, and pull every seven days. Uh, and with this new split, now uh, I'm hitting push and pull every five days. So it allows me to increase the frequency uh, of training my upper body. Again, going back to that whole thing where now I'm training everything more equally. In the off season, I was training my legs way, way, way more than I was training my upper body. And now that we get into a deficit, I'm training everything every five days. So my training split is like more well-rounded uh, and more even, which is going to allow me to, to maintain uh, my size uh, and maintain my performance better. Uh, it also increases my training days from four to five, which is going to help uh, with energy expenditure. Uh, and, and I know that this may be kind of counterintuitive uh, because what I mentioned in the off season uh, when I talked earlier was that, you know, one of the best changes that I could have made in the off season was dropping to four days uh, instead of five. Uh, and and in, in theory, that would still work in a calorie deficit. Uh, and I am definitely not opposed to training to four days per week. Uh, when I start to get into the nitty gritty of the cut and it really starts to get hard, I will reduce my training days to four per week because it's just going to allow for even more recovery. Uh, but at the beginning uh, of the, the cut, while I still have a lot of fat to lose, training five days per week uh, is going to help me burn more calories than training four days per week. And that's pretty elementary and pretty straightforward. You know, it's pretty, you know, simple to think that someone who trains five days per week is going to burn more calories than someone who trains four. Assuming, you know, that all the training sessions and everything are equal. Uh, if you take me training five days per week, uh, versus training four days per week, I burn more calories doing five days per week than I do four, uh, which is just obviously going to help uh, with getting the fat loss going. And it also decreases the systemic fatigue per week because of the decreased frequency of my leg sessions. And this is kind of what I talked about earlier uh, in, in the episode. So when you're doing legs every other day, Pretty much every time that you do a leg day, you typically will have like one or two exercises that really cause like tremendous amounts of fatigue. So whether it's a leg press, a hack squat, uh, an RDL, whatever, the exercises that you're typically doing in a leg workout cause much more fatigue per set than the exercises that you do on your push and pull days. One set of a hack causes more uh, fatigue than one set of a press or one set of a row. One set of a RDL causes way more fatigue than one set of a pull down uh, or um, a cable fly. I'm just making shit up as I go. 
But the point that I'm trying to make is, is that the leg sessions are the hardest sessions of the week. The leg sessions are the sessions that cause the greatest amount of fatigue because the exercises that we do in our leg sessions uh, are, are massive compound movements. When we do squatting and hip hinge patterns, we're involving almost every body uh, part in, in our body. Uh, and so uh, as we recruit more muscles and more muscle groups in these exercises, we also create more fatigue because of that. And so if I'm doing two leg days per week, the amount of systemic fatigue that I experience throughout the course of that week uh, is going to be higher than if I only have one leg day per week. Uh, and so even though I am increasing my, uh, my total uh, sessions from four days per week to five days per week, which you may think, okay, if he's training more, uh, then he's going to be uh, causing more fatigue. But you have to understand uh, that the, the leg sessions, which are the heavy hitters, uh, are decreasing in frequency. So even though, and you know, there really is no way to quantify this, I can really only explain this by feel, uh, I personally think that a split where I do four days per week with two of those days being full-blown, hard-ass leg days uh, causes more fatigue than a five-day split where I only really have one session uh, that causes large amounts of fatigue. Uh, my push and pull days are definitely not easy, but they are considerably easier than a leg day. I mean, leg days are, are fucking hard, and, and a push and pull day, uh, especially a pull day where you don't have anything that's like a bent over rowing movement, uh, a pull day where you're only doing like cable and, and machine rowing and pull down exercises and a push day where you're only doing presses and flies and laterals causes considerably less fatigue than a leg session where I'm squatting uh, or deadlifting. So uh, even though the, the total number of training days per week increases, in my eyes, the, the total amount of systemic fatigue actually decreases slightly uh, because I am getting rid of the, the frequency of the heavy hitter uh, leg sessions. All right, let's talk about uh, some of the adjustments that I'm making to my nutrition. So obviously, uh, you know, we need to reduce calories uh, in order to help create a, a caloric deficit. Uh, I, I'm actually going to be doing something different uh, this year with my cut uh, than I've done uh, ever before. Uh, I'm actually going to keep my rest day food exactly where it is right now. So uh, my two rest days each week are going to be are going to stay at 4,250 calories. Literally, excuse me, I, I, I'm literally going to carry my, um, my off-season diet over into the cut. And, and I'm going to have two days of the week where I eat my full-blown off-season diet. Uh, the, the same foods that I was eating in the same amounts, the same meals that I was eating. Every single day in the off-season, I am still going to have two days out of the week in my cut. Uh, I am going to reduce my calories on training days only to get the, the cut started. Uh, and I am gonna get pretty aggressive uh, with my training day deficit. So I'm eating about 3,300 calories uh, per day on my training days, which is about a 1,000 calorie uh, decrease from where it was in the off season. So th the way that I'm kind of thinking about this is that it will allow me to have my training days kind of be focused on fat loss because my training days are gonna be the days where I'm gonna have the highest level of expenditure uh, and I'm also going to have my lowest amount of food and then my rest days are going to be more focused on recovery. This is something that I've talked about on my TikTok channel a lot but typically when I get into a deficit I like to keep my rest day food higher than my training day food uh, because the purpose of a rest day is obviously to rest and recover and food is a very important piece of that puzzle and so I find if I take a rest day but I also eat like low calories I don't feel as rest rested as what I would have felt if I took uh, a rest day and ate higher calories. And, and I kind of think that that's common sense. You know, m more food that we eat, you know, the more recovery. So uh, when I get into a, a calorie deficit, uh, I, I really am going to uh, have my training days be my lower calorie days and my rest days uh, be my higher calorie days. This is really going to uh, prioritize performance and recovery around the leg days. Because if you remember my split, my split is push, pull, rest, legs, and rest. So I have a rest day before and after my leg days. So if I'm eating higher calories the day before my leg day, that's going to help fuel me and set me up to have a productive leg day the next day. And then if I have higher calories the day after that leg day, that's going to help me recover uh, from that leg session, but it's also going to help me fuel the next put the next two days uh, of push and pull. Uh, so I, I, I really feel like sandwiching the leg day between 
two rest days, having a rest day before and a rest day after, and also having higher calories and higher carbs uh, on those days is going to help uh, with just overall recovery, specifically recovery uh, and performance around the leg days, which as I've mentioned uh, a bunch of times before, is the main priority. I, I'm still holding my leg days uh, as like my top priority because I need to keep my leg size. And the way that I do that is by keeping my leg uh, performance uh, exactly where it is, if not continuing to increase it. Uh, even though uh, I'm keeping my rest, my uh, calories higher on rest days, this still is going to create a, a pretty large calorie deficit uh, for the week. And, and I kind of actually want to lay this out to you guys with uh, with some math. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, I'm eating around 4,250 calories per day. Uh, and if we take that times seven, uh, I'm eating around 27,750 calories per week. And this is pretty safe for me to assume that this is caloric maintenance for me. As I mentioned, my body weight has maintained between the 228 to 230 range uh, for the past six weeks uh, eating this level of food. So it's very easy for me to conclude that 4,250 calories per day, 29,750 calories per week is caloric maintenance for me. And so if we, if we do some math here, you'll see 4,250 calories times two because I'm eating uh, that level of food on my two rest days. And then on my five training days, I'm eating 3,300 calories. That gives me a total weekly caloric intake of 25,000 calories, which is 4,750 calories less uh, than what my weekly uh, caloric maintenance calories are. So this is gonna be anywhere between one to a pound and a half uh, a fat loss per week uh, getting my uh, getting my diet started uh, with this level of food. So I, I kind of wanted to lay this out with you guys mathematically just to kind of show you guys that even though I'm not eating in a deficit all seven days of the week, at the end of the week, I am still in a pretty noticeable caloric deficit because the size of my deficit on my training days or my deficit days uh, is pretty significant and, and that starts to add up. Uh, so I, I, I feel really, really confident heading into uh, my cutting phase that I'm gonna be able to get some really easy uh, and effortless fat loss uh, by following a, a diet set up like this. Uh, let's talk about some of the uh, adjustments that I'm making to my expenditure. Uh, and this is going to be pretty quick because I'm not actually changing anything uh, about my expenditure. Uh, I'm leaving my steps exactly where they are. So I'm going to start off the cut still averaging around the four to 5,000 uh, steps per day. Obviously, that's pretty low. But as I mentioned, I am very confident that the deficit that I'm creating from the food reduction is going to be more than enough to get fat loss started. Uh, and so I don't feel the need to also increase my steps because the the deficit that I'm going to create through eating less food is going to be plenty sufficient in order to get fat loss started. So increasing my steps as well just kind of seems unnecessary and kind of seems like overkill. Now there will eventually get to a point uh, where my weight loss stalls. And then once my weight loss stalls, then I have a choice. Do I want to reduce calories more or do I want to increase my expenditure uh, or do I want to do a combination of both? And when I get to the point where my weight loss has stalled and it is time for me to increase my expenditure, I will increase it. Uh, but at the beginning of the deficit, it is not necessary for me to increase my steps. Uh, I'm going to get plenty uh, of a caloric deficit through reducing my food as aggressively as I have. And so I just want to keep my steps exactly where they are. Uh, and then when it comes time for me to bump those up, I will do that. But that time is not right now. I, I don't need to start my cut off uh, doing that. And, and this is very important uh, to understand because uh, I, you need to think long term when you do a cut like this, especially a cut that has the potential to turn into a contest prep. If I start my cut off on the bat, making a huge pull of food and bumping my steps up, there's eventually going to come a point where I need to make a caloric adjustment. I, I need to make an adjustment to continue to be in a deficit. Uh, and, and that process is going to repeat throughout the course of the cut. And so uh, basically when I start a cut, I like to think of it like as playing like a game of cards. You know, you've got, you know, this card that you can play, this card that you can play, this card that you can play. Uh, and you have all these tools available to you that you can use over the course of your deficit uh, in order to keep the deficit going and keep the fat loss going. And if you play all of your cards at the beginning of the deficit, you are inevitably going to reach uh, a point where you stick. And if you've played your cards at the beginning of the deficit, what card are you going to play when you get to the sticking point? 
you don't have any cards to play left because you've already played them at the very beginning. Uh, and then at that point, that's when you need to start using drug intervention, and, and that's when steps start to get to you know 20,000 or something ridiculous like that, uh, and calories get super, super low. Uh, and, and so really starting things off uh, nice and easy uh, is really going to be the best way to go about things so that, you know, weeks, months down the line, I still have plenty uh, of room to increase my steps and decrease my food. I, I don't want to get super duper aggressive and play all of my cards uh, right off the bat. So I'm leaving my expenditure uh, exactly where it is. Uh, and then uh, I actually got a walking pad uh, in our apartment, which is basically like a treadmill that does an incline. So I, I have no excuse now uh, not to get my steps in. Uh, over the course of the past couple of weeks, holiday weeks, it's been pretty cold uh, in Chicago here. And so it's been hard to go outside and get my steps in. Uh, but ever since I got this uh, little treadmill here, I have no excuse uh, to not be able to get my steps in. So steps are not something that I'm worried about. I can always get more steps. Uh, I just don't feel the need to make any adjustments to my steps right now. I, I feel like uh, I'm going to get plenty of a calorie uh, deficit and, and plenty of fat loss uh, through the nutritional adjustments, and I can leave my steps where they are for now. Okay, final thing that I want to talk about is I kind of want to talk about some of the adjustments that I'm making to my PEDs. Everybody loves drug talk, right? Uh, well, I, uh, I, I really hate to break it to you guys, but there isn't really a whole lot uh, for me to, to talk about here. Uh, so currently, I'm cruising uh, at 150 milligrams of testosterone per week, and I've been doing this for the course of the past six weeks. Uh, when I entered my uh, caloric maintenance phase that I talked about earlier, I also reduced uh, my testosterone usage from 350 milligrams to 150 milligrams. I uh, just wanted to take a couple of weeks to uh, obviously like uh, resensitize myself, uh, get healthy, uh, because when you're taking a super physiological amount uh, of drugs, uh, even if your blood work turns out good, like there's probably some underlying things that are going on. Uh, so I wanted to uh, kind of focus uh, on health days. Uh, and, uh, and, and reducing my PEDs uh, allows me to do that. Uh, and as I enter a deficit, I am actually not going to increase my PEDs at all because I don't think that it is necessary. As I mentioned earlier in the podcast, my goal during this deficit is to maintain my muscle, not build it. And I can maintain my muscle by maintaining my training performance. And I don't need to take large amounts of drugs to maintain my training performance. I can maintain my training performance on a cruise dose uh, of testosterone. Uh, and, and this is something that a lot of enhanced uh, athletes are really afraid to do is when they go into a deficit, they're under the impression, oh, I'm in a deficit, I'm gonna lose muscle, I need to take more drugs when I'm dieting in order to prevent that muscle loss. Uh, and, and I do think that there is a point in the deficit where you do need to increase your drug usage, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but uh, the beginning of the deficit, it, it's not necessary. Right now, my, my body fat is, is pretty high, uh, and, and my calories are still pretty high. I mean, even on my low days, I'm still eating over 3,300 calories. Like, that's still plenty of food. Uh, I don't need to use uh, tons of drugs uh, in order to maintain uh, my, my training performance. I don't, I don't use tons of drugs, period. I mean, the, the most amount of drugs I've ever taken in my life is 350 milligrams uh, of testosterone, which is kitty doses. I'm, I'm swimming in the kitty pool. Uh, with my drug usage yet. I, I am by no means uh, a, a PED abuser. I am, I am still on like level one or level two uh, of PED usage. So my performance and my physique is not like so far away from, you know, uh, like attainable levels that I need to take large amounts of drugs to be able to maintain my training performance. That is just not the case. As I mentioned, I can maintain my training performance easily on this cruise dose of testosterone. I've fucking been doing it the past six weeks. Uh, nothing is going to change uh, when I reduce uh, my, my food at all. Uh, and, and I can maintain my training performance on, on, on low level of testosterone. So I don't need to, to unnecessarily take uh, a higher level uh, of PEDs when it's just not needed. Now, there will eventually come a time as I get leaner and my body weight gets lighter that it will be harder and harder for me to maintain my training performance. And that is when I will increase my PEDs. 
when I get to the point where I'm like, okay, training is really, really hard now, depending on, you know, no matter how many times I deload, you know, I've just lost so much weight uh, and, and I'm considerably weaker now, that is when the PEDs get played because then you can add those in. They'll kind of bring you back to life training performance wise. Uh, and they'll also help with, uh, with fat loss uh, and, and, and muscle retention. So uh, going back to the card thing that I mentioned on the, on the step slide, Increasing my PED usage is one of my cards, but that is not a card that I feel like I need to play uh, at the beginning uh, of the deficit. I, I, I very much feel uh, like I can maintain my training performance and maintain all of the muscle that I've built uh, for you know the first you know couple months at least of my cut uh, before I'm really going to feel the need to to increase uh, my drug usage uh, from there. So again, I know that everybody loves to be fascinated about the drugs, but honestly, guys, like the drugs are like five to 10% uh, of this whole thing. The way that I'm going to maintain my muscle mass is through smart training programming uh, and, and making sure that I am maintaining my training performance. And, and I don't need large amounts of drugs uh, to be able to do that. All right, guys, that's uh, pretty much it for today. So I, I kind of just wanted to run you guys through some of those X's and O's, kind of want to give you guys some of my thought process, like how do I transition from uh, ending a bulk uh, into a, a calorie deficit? How do I adjust my training, drugs, uh, steps, uh, nutrition, all of that stuff. Like how, how do I make those uh, adjustments uh, and how am I going to make those adjustments as I head uh, into 2023? So uh, as always, guys, if you have any questions or anything, please feel free to reach out, whether it's a DM, leave a question uh, or a comment, a uh, question in the comments. Uh, and I will go ahead and get that answered. Uh, as always, if you guys have any suggestions for future podcast episodes uh, or future lecture episodes like this, then please let me know. Uh, and if you guys are interested in online coaching or a consultation call, then please check out my website, btbtraining.net slash services. Uh, BTB training, that's B as in boy, T as in Tom, B as in boy, training.net slash services. All right, guys, thank you so much for watching. As I mentioned, hopefully you guys all had a happy holiday and a happy new year. Uh, I hope that you guys are excited to stay tuned uh, with my cut because I am very excited to, to get it started. So hopefully you guys uh, enjoyed this video and, and maybe learned something. Uh, maybe I kind of, you know, sparked a thought uh, in your head or something that you hadn't thought about. Uh, and, and if I did, I would like to hear about that. So, all right, guys, uh, I'm going to let you guys go uh, and I will talk to you next time. Thank you so much for watching, guys. And as always, take care of yourselves. Uh.